Hello, welcome to Revelator Alpha. I hope you're all well. So this is another installment, another episode of the live video podcast, radio show, sing-along, ding-along, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so it is all about motorcycles. Yeah, it's all about the latest news, the latest chat. Uh, what's going on in the motorcycle world and you know what i'm just going to open up for a free-for-all discussion as well but there are a few things uh that i'm going to cover uh today uh, i'm going to be talking there we go all new bikes that's right uh there's I'm going to get straight into it, guys. Straight into it, uh, uh, as I always like to do these days. <laughs> these days, <laughs> as if I've been doing this for years and years. Uh, so this new live show, which I'm doing, I'm, so I'm trying to do it as often as I can. I'm still doing the videos, uh, but not as often, uh, as you might have noticed on the channel. Uh, you can still support uh, the channel, uh, but with super stickers, super thanks, super chats and everything like that. I'll try and get into the comments later. Please, you leave your comments. Let us know uh, where you're at, what you're doing, what you think of uh, all the bikes that I'm featuring or all the discussion topics as well. Uh, you can go to the website, revelatehealth.com. There's uh, lots of information there as well and uh, support uh, areas as well. And a bit more about me if you're interested in me, everything about me, of course. But hey, listen, let's just, enough of that. Let's just talk about the stuff that you're here for, right? Uh, so I'm going to be talking a bit, a bit about Triumph. Uh, Hesketh are, are in the news today. Uh, Mack Motorcycles are in the news. BMW, Ducati uh, are in the news as well. Uh, some big news for Avon Tires. Uh, if you are uh, if you ride with Avon, tire, Avon Cobra Chromes, uh, this is for you. So watch out for this one. A uh, bit of news from Suzuki. KTM and MV Augusta are in the news. But Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson can't escape a bit of a notice. And also Livewire as well. Livewire the company I'm talking about, not Livewire the motorcycle. Uh, but, you know, and I've got a couple of new products, some ingenious products, I think, that, that have come out as well. And then I'm just going to open it up to anybody. So let us know in the comments if you anything you want to talk about uh, this afternoon. I'm going to go on for as long as I can, really, and uh, see what's happening. But look, the first thing, uh, first thing to do then is really I'm going to talk uh, a bit about this. Uh, Triumph Motorcycles have just launched. Well, they sent me a press release uh, this week, and they've just launched uh, this new Street Triple 765, and it comes in three different um, different guises, I suppose, is, is the best way to, to describe it. So I'm going to put it on the, the screen here for you. And this is basically, this is direct from Triumph themselves, okay? Triumph uh, Motorcycles. And they got this uh, Street Triple 765R, that's coming in at nine and a half thousand pounds. The RS, which is eleven thousand two hundred ninety-five, and the uh, the Moto Two, which is thirteen thousand seven hundred ninety-five. So basically, you know, you're just going up and up in spec. I mean, I'll quickly show you the spec here, which is, you know, it's, it's pretty decent actually. Uh, Seven six five. It's um, one hundred eighteen brake horsepower. Yeah, 80 newton meters uh, of torque at uh, 9,500 RPM. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a high horsepower, high rev and bike. Also, all these are multi-point sequential electronic fuel injection with electronic throttle uh, control, uh, stainless steel three into one because these are triples, of course, uh, triple cylinders, uh, X ring chain, yeah, wet multi plate uh, um, clutch, six speed, uh, aluminium beam, twin spar frame. It just goes on and on. Uh, cast alloy wheels, uh, five spokes, 17 inches, front and rear. Um, Showa, 41 mil uh, upside down forks. And uh, Showa, piggyback reservoir, monoshock, adjustable compression uh, for the rear. Uh, you've got front brakes. You've got twin 310 uh, millimeter floating discs. Uh, Brembo uh, four piston uh, calipers at the front ABS of course standard stuff and the rear is a single 220 disc Brembo again uh, single piston uh, caliper a lot of manufacturers have gone for this sort of single piston deal in the in the uh, rear uh, in recent years actually well in recent years the last couple of years but anyway, listen. This is this is what they've come out with, and I think this is this is an interesting one from 
Uh, I mean, this is basically the street, the the the, uh, the flagship, as it were. Um, this is one. This is a more sporty one. But as I say, you can get the other ones. I, you know, just like the. Um, just like the uh, the speed triple, which they introduced a few months ago with the fairing and everything, I've got a feeling that they probably should have done that with this as well. Put it with, or have a, an option, like another variant, to have this as with a slight fairing, more of a fared bike here, or more of a fair, like a nose fairing here as well at, at the front. I just feel that it's kind of missing something, especially if you're going for this, you know, sportier number, the Moto2 type uh, styling. Look, great bike. I mean, you know, I've known a few people who've had uh, the smaller versions, as it were, from previous incarnations, the 675, uh, the Street Triple. I think this one is is you know the, the the nuts really but i think it's it just needs something it needs something here for me and i think especially if you're going to go for that you know then go for it oh yeah i know it's a different bar and everything it's got wider bars and all that sort of stuff but listen you know i think good stuff from triumph i i'm i've got to say i've i wasn't so sure about it myself um when the press release first came in. I mean, it looks, it's got a nice profile. It's got a nice stance. I say so you, you can definitely see uh, there's a difference in styling between the three. Uh, but as I say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, I, th I think uh, a round of applause for Triumph, for, I think, for doing a, a decent job here. Um, I say not, um, uh, but it's the 765. It's, if, if those of you remember, uh, Triumph, really came out with the triple engine and they've sort of redesigned this engine i think they've basically shed weight on the engine but up the horsepower as well um and they've they worked on this engine for quite a while but the 675 was it a 675 that they had um that was great on the track it was great in the original street triple as well so it's you know the the, the smaller version um had great sold in great numbers but that bike on the track the 675 was a really really decent bike uh ridden i rode it back in the day really really good so it's um it's an interesting it's a, it's an interesting um uh over time for triumph i think it's an interesting time for them to bring out this bike but i just think it lacks a little bit of a i don't know i think it just lacks a little fairing there if, if you're into these kind of bikes of course uh and i think it's going to be quite a big year for triumph as well 2023 um there are some other bits and pieces uh, which they're bringing out as well they've just launched that chrome collection uh on their bikes and they had a big, uh, you know, fanfare uh, of that as well. But as I say, you know, there we go. It's, uh, uh, you know, Triumph, they've, uh, they've started the year off in earnest. Uh, so well done to Triumph. There we go. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so the next, uh, the next uh, company, I suppose, that many may, never, may not have heard of. And this comes from uh, Visor Down, uh, the magazine here. Uh, but it's about Hesketh uh, motorcycles. Who've basically, uh, they're launching this Hersey 450 single cylinder uh, initially. Uh, so it's officially announced, I should say, is, is the, the way they're to be said. And let me just show you a couple of close-up pictures here. I mean, it looks decent uh, for a bike. I mean, Hesketh's kind of hand-built bikes or bespoke bikes and things like that. But... Um, I mean, just looking from it, I mean, this it kind of reminds me of that 675 a little bit in many ways, uh, the stance. It kind of reminds me, It's it's got elements from lots of different uh, bikes, I think. Um, and that's just nice, a shot of the tank. Oh, wrong one. Um, but there we go. I mean, it's nice, nice little bike. I mean, it's a 450, it's a V-twin. Um uh, and it's, obviously, it's a, it's a British brand as well. A lot of these, uh, Hesketh have kind of, I wouldn't say they've they've always hidden in the shadows, but they're, you know, they're a small bespoke manufacturer. Let's put it that way. Uh, the bike has been heralded as the Isle of Man based brands, uh, most technologically advanced machine to date, featuring Euro 5 single cylinder. Oh, sorry. This is a single cylinder. Um, what, what was I reading with the V-Twin? Brand not to be sorry, not to be powered by a V twin. Okay, so this is the 
it's the first motorcycle model from the brand not to be powered by a V-twin. Okay, that, that, that's probably more the, the right thing to say, exactly. Uh, and it's a single-cylinder air-cooled. Uh, it's got air-cooled ABS, um, ba, 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 and it's £14,000. So, look, it's, it's you know... <laughs> You know, all I can say is four 450cc, I think you're 14,000 pounds. I think you've got to like this bike. I think you've got to like this bike and what it stands for and the, the brand and everything like that. The heart of the bike is a 450 single cylinder engine that is related, that found in a venerable Honda XR400 Enduro machine. Power and torque should be fairly modest, especially when compared to the firm's previous machines. You're expecting 30 to 40 brake horsepower when the final spec is confirmed. The chassis features uh, ready mounted brakes, um, uh, KTEX suspension, and a hand built frame. You know, this is all. So, these, I mean, this is a, the, the price tag is with the, you know, goes hand in hand, I suppose. Uh, it goes hand in hand with the the fact that it's hand built as well but like hesker n- n- nice stuff from from them uh and uh all good stuff uh as far as as far as i can tell um right so the next uh who was the next ones i'm going to talk about here oh yes right here we go so i've just got to get back to my page and this is uh well a company that maybe nobody's even never heard of Mac Motorcycles. Now, this actually comes from uh, Motorcycle News. This is the basically British firm. Again, they're going to uh, they've they've introduced um, a second model. It's called the Rex, and it's a single cylinder uh, bike. Uh, and it's you know these are small bikes, small commuter bikes. And again, British manufacturer. Nice looking bike. I and mean, I've got some close up pictures here for you. Uh, I say I I, I kind of like the British bikes, these kind of British styles as well. Uh, but you know, there's some nice, there's nice, definitely some nice features on it. I do like this twin uh, exhaust setup, uh, this dual exhaust setup. I really do. Brembo brakes, yeah, it's a nice all round bike. I mean, these are kind of megaphone type uh, silencers, aren't they? I mean, they're looking uh, pretty tasty. Um, but uh, it's got another bike as well. They got another bike. Uh, they're going to be at the motorcycle live show. So I'll be, I'll be that's uh, here in the UK. Uh, next, uh, the well, when is it? Uh, in a couple of weeks time, three weeks time. Uh, the upright machine shares the set, shares the same tubular steel backbone frame. SWM produced 600 cc uh, motor and then Silla is at Max Ruby Cafe Racer, uh, which uh, NBC reported in July. Okay, this is uh, what they've done. Uh, yeah, so we go. The single seat Rex differs from the Ruby. With see, I actually went to the uh, to the Mac. Uh, I went to the Mac website, and uh, they're only talking about the Ruby, which is uh, their previous uh, bike. Um, uh, but uh, it so now obviously they've they have haven't even updated their own website, which is a bit odd, uh, I think. But anyway, the, both the Rex and the Ruby uh, models produce 52 brake horsepower from their four valve fuel injection motor uh there's also a hydraulic clutch a six-week gearbox um uh, the tailpieces are more relaxed but the 760 seat height remains the same on both models uh it's got any other specs on here no it's uh overall wheelbase is 1430 elsewhere uh Brembo brakes, uh, front single radial caliper, uh, 320 millimeter floating disc, uh, Brembo master cylinder and rear caliper, 240 uh, rear disc. Yeah, yeah. I mean, decent. I mean, it looks, you know, pretty decent. As I say, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested to look at Mac motorcycles when I go to the the motorcycle live, and to say if you're going there, you know, have a look at them and have a look at what they've uh, what they've got to offer. Okay, so that's uh, that's Mac Motorcycles, and uh, yeah, Oops, sorry, wrong one. There we go. Okay, so this next this next brand is well, some that you would really know. (laughs) 
BMW. BMW. Uh, uh, I've been in the news for different reasons, obviously. Uh, you know, updates to their bikes, new models and everything. Now, when the R18 came out and uh, a couple of years ago, and I, I reviewed that bike uh, when it first came out, actually. I was l- lucky enough to get on one straight away. And I was really quite impressed with it. And then lots of other people, of course, as it's become more popular and as they've tried to market the bike and more and more, they've reviewed it in both, you know, in this country and, and all around Europe and all around the world, of course, the United States. Some notable big YouTubers have, you know, got on it. They've bought one and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and and they, they rave about it. As I'm sure they do. I'm sure they like it. But at the time, I was saying, and even before they brought it out, I I made a few videos about it saying that uh, there's actually some other models in the pipeline. And um, no, again, this is where my sources come in, uh, but but nobody had heard about this. And basically, they were coming out with Taurus, with baggers, that kind of thing. And uh, all that was coming from custom design, uh, custom design, What's the word I'm looking for? They weren't realized customs, but they were custom drawings and everything like that, which I was told about. Okay, so now we have the R18, but you have the R18, the Bagger, and the uh, the Tora, the Transcontinental. All of those have come from those original custom drawings, as it were. Okay, so now we've got the R18, and BMW have got these seven, seven. They've invited custom uh, builders. Uh, well, I'm not sure if they invite custom builders, but they've 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 made uh, R18s in the styles of of custom creations from around the world. Now, if when the R18 first came out, uh, as well, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, aftermarket parts suppliers and also uh, designer Roland Sands, he he teamed up with BMW. In fact, he teamed up with BMW long before. This R18, uh, he was doing stuff with the GS as well. I mean, I interviewed Ronan Sands quite a long time ago, many moons ago now. And he's basically saying that we had a long chat about bikes, about parts. And uh, when I say chat, um, a Q&A chat, you know, um, uh, email type to and fro, not physical uh, verbal chat. Uh, but I asked him lots of questions and he was answering. And he's basically saying that, you know, the, the BMW is this bike that he would get on and uh, just ride for miles and miles and miles. Uh, and, you know, he would also work with them to produce custom parts. And obviously, when they brought out the R18, he was one of those guys who was actually making a Roland Sands BMW R18s and other uh, custom uh, bikes as well. So if you look here, let me just show you uh, some of their uh, their creations here go to the top of the screen and there's some really there's some really nice bikes here um so this is uh the blackjack uh they've got the uh, isle of man uh the liberty and the roadster the raw the gonzalez and the great wave so what i'm going to do i'm going to put up uh, pictures of these for you and then uh, you can make up your own mind okay so this is uh, so this is the blackjack. Um, basically, it's uh, from head to toe. It's R18 ch- uh, channel stealth mode with lots of black lacquer and black chrome. Oh, I, I kind of like this bike. I've got to say, it really is my kind of my kind of ride. I've got to say, um, sweet and darkened features including headlight ring, air filter cowl, fuel fill- filler cap, matte black uh, side pipe uh, style. I, I, that's one thing about the R18, which I'm not, the standard stock R18, I'm not so keen on, uh, is that exhaust that sort of, um, it's just, it, you either like it or you don't, and I, I, I tend not to like it, but it's, um, it's a beautiful bike. Okay, so the next one uh, that they've got is this uh, Isle of Man. Um, this bike uh, references uh, George Mayer's CTT win back in 1939, riding a BMW RS uh, 255 compressor. The large red 49 was Mayer's racing number, with the rest of the bike finishing Isle of Man green metallic, uh, familiar color. You may have seen it on the BMW M4. I mean, that's a nice looking bike, I've got to say. Okay, uh, the next one that they've uh, come here, uh, this is the uh, Liberty. Uh, this is kind of a bit, bit futuristic uh, for me as well. It um, includes handmade body components made from scratch by uh, Powett Statura. It includes such hits 
as the round instrument integrated uh, into the fuel tank center tunnel, exclusive leather handmade seat, uh, seat upholstery and side pocket and rear mud guards. I mean, it looks really nice. I mean, I love these mud guards on there. Absolutely. Uh, not mud guards, uh, exhaust on there. Those are really nice. But it, it just looks, it kind of reminds me of, a, a sort of futuristic bike if you know what i mean a bike that is you know in the near future you know you can just imagine um the world you know the world gone mad in 20 years time and uh everybody's living you know underground or something but there's there's a few people living on the surface and this is what they're riding around on that kind of yeah i know i've, I've obviously <laughs> i've had too many uh drinks today obviously but you, know, you get my point this is an interesting one the roadster apparently inspired by automotive engineering from the 20s and 30s it's kind of got that that feel that yeah it says a dash of art deco i was just about to say art deco here uh with a new seat bench and additional fuel tank this gives a sportier sporty appearance mixed with a rarer less seen smaller bmw kidney grill yeah i mean it's it looks nice i say it, they haven't really done much with with the exhaust because i think that is very much art deco styling isn't it the exhaust but as i say i mean i'm uh, it, out of all these custom creations that's my least favorite i would say this one i really like this kind of bobber style i'm, I'm I, it's my kind of thing anyway uh raw not a line but the fruit of a 2019 concept study that focuses on a light rear section uh using details like a rear short mudguard and the swinging saddle okay with two uh two coil springs yeah, okay. Uh, the short exhaust is a sound silencer, mind, mind, sound silencer, mind. So uh, it'll, yeah, that it'll basically, in other words, sound silencer without a silencer. In other words, this is, yeah, roaring. This is a, a loud one. Uh, so if uh, those of you uh, got sensitive ears, uh, you won't want to have this one. But that looks, uh, as we would say in the UK, that is the DBs, uh, the, the dog's bollocks, as it were. Uh, this next one here, the Speedy Gonzalez. I'm look, this is a very kind of Chicano style, um, the, the you know, Cholo style ish esque, I suppose. Uh, named after the fastest mouse in Mexico, <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Uh, BMW designed this uh, R18 with a comfortable seating for riding along the Mexican roads. Yeah, you, are you sure? Are you sure about that? Um, I'm not sure you want to be riding that on Mexican roads, mate. Because uh, uh, well, if you've seen Million Dollar Bogans uh, vlog recently, you know, obviously they're pretty awful. But there we go. Uh, finishing blue black airbrush with uh, filigree filigree uh, lines. This bike is definitely one that will stand out. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, it's got it's got some nice lines. It's almost like a big. It's got. If for me, it's got quite a few Indian features, especially with that rear rear tail um so the the exhaust I, I i'm not that keen on this sort of style of bike i must say they, they're fine they're great if you like it but i say not not great for me okay the last one again this again this is more my style uh this japanese style bomber motorbike the ro team pays particular attention to its paintwork using special techniques to make it appear as if it's been around for decades yeah they're basically um uh you know they've aged the paint uh basically so it's a brand new bike of course but it just looks it just looks a little bit aged but listen this is this is all from bmw and i've got to say i, th I think they've done a, a decent job here you know they've they've they're telling people they're showing people look we are bmw yes uh we make bikes that, that are v very uh you know they work and they're they're great and all this sort of stuff but look, we can be just like an Indian. We can be just like a Harley Davidson. We can be anything you want it to be. These bikes can be customized. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be parts out there. And, you know, and it's just like any bike. As soon as people start working on them and showing that you can customize them and they come out with custom creations, then manufacturers latch onto this straight away. You'll see lots of aftermarket parts. And this will kind of bring up that. They will bring up that, that market, I'm sure. But the R18 itself, I think, is a is a lovely, lovely bike. It really is a lovely bike. Um, th there's some weirdness to it, uh, I've got to say, but but it's a it, it's a lovely bike to ride. And I think I would much rather be riding one of these custom creations, custom bikes, rather than the original R18. Now the bobber, 
uh, not the bobber, the the bagger that they've got, I think is a really nice bike. But anyway, that's uh, that's that's just me. Let's say. Uh, so there you go. That's the um, that's the BMW. So that's uh, all good there. Right. So the next one here. Now I kind of touched on this uh, a couple of weeks ago, but this is um, this is all about this outfit here. And uh, Ducati, Ducati have come up with a with their Diavel for 2023. Uh, I've already mentioned this in previous uh, li sort of uh, live streams and shows. But the, you know the this the muscle bike, the muscle cruiser, the sports cruiser, whatever you want to call it. Um, basically, they they've they've ditched the old power unit uh, and they put the the, the old V four uh, sorry V twin and they put the V four uh, power in, which is in uh, some of their other bikes as well. Obviously, detuned different profile. But it, it look, it's again a bit of a funny looking bike. I always thought the Diavel, you know, that front, the, the way it slopes down. But I can see, it. I, I, I can definitely see um, it, it looks great at the shows, I think. And it looks good in size. And when, it, when I see them riding around, I think, wow, that's a decent looking bike. I'd love to have a go on one. I, in fact, I really should. I really should go and have a go on one and see what, see what it is. But let me just uh, show you the. Uh, the uh the website hey, again from motorcycle news they basically said the muscle cruiser okay i suppose that's what you want to call i would call it a performance cruiser i suppose but there we go uh, has become the latest line of models from bologna from uh from du to get it from ducati to ditch the traditional v-twin motor in favor of the liquid cooled v4 yeah lots of their bikes are going to this v4 now uh the apne name diavel v4 will arrive in january close to do you know what Twenty three thousand five hundred and ninety five for the red, and twenty three thousand eight hundred and ninety five for the black. I don't think I know it's a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me. Wrong. I know it's a lot of money, but I don't think it's a lot of money for that bike. I've got to say, and it, it's claiming one hundred sixty six point three brake horsepower and ninety foot. 93 foot pounds of torque from its 1158 cc v4 gran turismo motor uh first seen in the large capacity multistrada adventure bike yep uh it's taken over from the diavel 1260 i think that only came out last year didn't it uh, the, the 1260 or was that the 1260s that they brought out uh which first arrived in 2019 okay yeah uh sorry so there we go the the new v4 was previously spotted in a series of spy shots back in september ducati are claiming it to be 13 kilograms lighter than the outgoing 1260s yeah shaving five kilos in the engine itself and a further eight pounds from the rest of the bike yeah it's you know it, it's it's still it's saying still uh 223 kilos and that's without the any fuel in it as well which holds 20 liters yeah 20 liters so it's uh yeah decent 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 looking bike i mean it really is from this angle from the rear quarter i think it looks really nice from the front quarter not so much i've got to say not so much i mean if i put this up here for you uh, for, so front quarter, not so much. However, rear quarter, yeah, I'm having a bit of that. I, I do like that. I do like that. So there we go. That is that is Ducati. Uh, they are, well, cruising for a bruising. Uh, <laughs> they, there you go. Uh, okay, so here's, here's uh, well, uh, those are the new bikes. Let's just get into, let's just get into the new, shall we? <laughs> And this is, I shed a tear when I heard this news. And this is all about Avon Tires. Uh, Avon Tires, who uh, make the Cobra Chromes, Avon Cobra Chromes, which I actually have on my uh, bike here. And obviously, they, they make all sorts of motorcycle tires. Of course, of course they do. Uh, but this is a story, again, from Visor Down. Uh, great work, guys, uh, coming out here. But it's basically saying that uh, their Cooper Tire and Rubber at Malksham in the UK, the Wiltshire facility, uh, is set to close with uh, 350 jobs at risk. Well, I suppose they'd lose their jobs, wouldn't they, unfortunately? Um, the plant is operated by Cooper Tire, 
uh, and rub itself a subsidiary of the tire giant Goodyear. Now, remember, I, I said a story a couple of weeks ago where Goodyear were moving their uh, their plant. And I can't remember if it was the same plant or a different plant. I've got a feeling it was either Wolverhampton or Coventry. And they were moving that to, uh, is it Spain or France, Monteclan or somewhere? Uh, anyway, so they've basically done the same here. Uh, they've... Um, they're, they're moving this it's it's a uh, sorry um yeah goodyear is moving the uh plant uh, previously you saw cutbacks in 2018 when the plant ceased producing car and suv tires as production moved to europe then production was moved to siberia although it's not yet known where the motorcycle tire manufacturing side of the business will move to the entire plant is now set to close by the end of this year that's close that's soon uh, the closure goes against reassurances given to retailers and customers in 2018 when Cooper general manager Yap Van Wessem um, claimed there were no plans to move production of the motorcycle tire division. Uh, and it just goes on and on. I mean, I urge you to go and read this as well. But look, this is an interesting thing here, I would say, from from uh, for, for, for Avon uh, tires, uh, for Cooper tire and, and rubber itself. Um, it really depends, I suppose, if, does this mean the end of Avon tires, or is this uh, is this purely that they're they're repurposing or, or or you know moving their manufacturing elsewhere? But the tires production is still going to happen. What are they going to do with the people that you know have lost their jobs? You know, it's not easy to relocate. Well, it's easy to relocate a factory, I suppose, but it's not easy to relocate people, is it? Um, you know, so you got a feeling, you got to, you would imagine that a lot of those people are going to lose their jobs. They won't find another job, and um, and that's that's the real sad thing here. Um, and because it's happening so soon, right to Christmas, yeah, Merry Christmas, Merry Merry Christmas, there, guys. You know, night, lovely Christmas present you're giving to people there. But look, I, yeah, I know needs must, and I know it's never a good time for this kind of thing to happen. But look. It happens. Uh, all I can say. Uh, all I can say. Just sad. I say. I mean, I'm, I'd say I'm not sure whether the you know, Avon will stop making tires. I think they probably will, but where they're going to make them, they're probably going to go to this French plant, and that's where uh, Goodyear, the parent company, they're going to say, right, we're going to put all motorcycle tire production, multi-brand tires in one production facility i would imagine i'm i'm not sure i'm not sure if that's the case but i would imagine that's going to be something like that okay uh so that is uh unfortunately that was them uh okay so the next one uh here is um let me just i'm gonna have to find in here here we go oops wrong one there we go. Da, da, da. Right. So, whew, right. Uh, it's about this this uh, company here. Suzuki have pretty much been out of the loop for a while, really. They haven't really done much in the in the stakes of new motorcycles. Not really, I, I wouldn't say. Uh, they haven't really uh, set the world alight. They've got a couple of new interesting uh, features and facilities, and I've sort of talked about those uh, in previous uh, live streams. But in terms of bikes, they haven't really done anything. However, this is an interesting thing for me because there's a story coming from um, Tempo, uh tempo this is a malaysian uh, i believe yeah malaysian uh website and uh, press agency here um but tempo.co uh, jakarta here so indonesia uh in during the indonesia motorcycle show uh suzuki indo mobile says uh, si indo mobile sales claimed that the company will be producing and this is the interesting one electric motorcycles in the next one to two years okay so this is it now what size these motorcycles are well, you know are they small size you know scooter type size moped style size or like you know whatever or, or larger i mean i get from the picture here i think they're intimating that could be you know larger capacity large more powerful so well here's here's the thing and this is where i kind of heart back to when i was talking about zero motorcycles or even harley davidson with the live wire and everything like that 
You see, those motorcycles, yes, they were first in the market, right? And those are the ones that have got quite a big market share, I suppose. Although it depends which you believe, you know, how many motorcycles are being sold uh, of these zero, uh, let's say zero or any of the electric bikes, how much are they actually being sold? Because of the price, right? It's the price and the range and the, the charging and all that kind of stuff. But I always said this, I said, you know, you've got to consider, actually, the Japanese haven't yet really come into the market you know, the big four Japanese brands, they haven't really come into the market yet. Yeah, I know Honda have done uh, a little bit. I'm talking about the bigger bikes, you know, that rival Harley-Davidson or rival, you know, a Zero or an Ajika or, or things like that. Um, but look, only a couple of weeks ago, kind of Kawasaki said, look, they're coming out with a few bikes in the next year or two. Now Suzuki coming out. You've got to look at price point. They're going to be coming in at a price. And I've got a feeling they're 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 going to wipe the floor with a lot of people, with a lot of other, other manufacturers. And they think they've been biding their time, biding their time to say, well, we're just going to come in when the market is fully developed, uh, and they've all been working together with these um, with these replaceable batteries that you just go into like a garage type place, you know, uh, whatever. You pull up on your your electric bike, you take the battery out your your bike and you pay five dollars or what or ten one hundred dollars and you get a, a battery off the rack you put it in your bike and away you go so they're all playing with these uh versions but as i say suzuki kawasaki you know honda yamaha i'm sure they're all coming out with electric bikes soon with the next two or three years so what's that going to mean for the likes of uh harley davidson livewire for zero for energy who've already got a uh, a foothold in the marketplace but they haven't had any serious competition from these guys then you got to think about the japanese and i've got another story i mean let's just okay let me just bring that up now um here which i talked about a few weeks ago which uh which is this chinese manufacturer da vinci uh da vinci motor who are launching their futuristic dc 100 which is this uh, orange bike here um let me just say they've got a bigger picture they haven't got a bigger picture um but they're going to be uh, debuting it in the eicma the in milan um next week uh, this coming week actually um and it's uh the the futuristic dc 100 is the first electric motorcycle designed to rival the performance of a thousand cc conventional motorcycle so it's a hyper it's a hyper motorcycle what the price is i don't know but it has an acceleration of uh, 0 to 60 miles an hour in three seconds i mean three seconds crikey and can reach a top speed of 124 miles per okay well it's not really um, rivaling the performance of a thousand cc then is it and has a range of 249 miles this is the most interesting thing range of 249 miles it can be conveniently charged at a level three dc fast charging stations with a full charge taking just about 30 minutes well and it just goes on and on and on right so look if the chinese are coming out with bikes electric bikes they're hitting the market uh with that all coming soon you know it's gonna be all different sizes. if the japanese are coming what does that mean for you know the, the likes of, you know, the likes of Harley Davidson, the live wire and stuff. And I'm, I'm going to come on to live wire in a minute and Harley Davidson. But, uh, you know, there we go. I'll get into the comments as I know that I can see some there, guys. Uh, and thanks for your comments. Please, I will, I will come, uh, come back to you, uh, soon. Uh, so I'll just try and get through all the news items. Then we can have a QA session at the end of it. Okay, so that's, you know, Suzuki, as I say, that, that's the big news, really. But here was the other one from, uh, I say, Da Vinci, they, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, motorcycle manufacturer, uh, you know, to, uh, to come in as well. Right, uh, so that's that one. Okay, the next, the next one is, well, it's all about these guys. And these guys. Okay, that's enough of that. Right, uh, here we go. Another story from Visor Down here. And interesting here, KTM has acquired 25% of the Italian maker MV Augusta. And it's the Pierre Mobility AG. There's the parent company. Now, again, maybe I've misquoted in the past, but I thought KTM was part owned by an Indian uh, motorcycle manufacturer. 
uh, or Indian in industrial power as well. But whether it's the parent company or part owned, I don't know. So if you got news of that, uh, let us know. I, I might have got that one completely wrong where I've quoted, you know, they are part owned. Anyway, that's a side issue. The, the issue here is that KTM have bought, KTM are in the news quite a lot recently because they're, you know, doing deals with like a Chinese motorcycle manufacturers. Uh, they're having... Um, they're having deals with like Indian uh, motorcycle manufacturers to produce other bikes as well. But here, the Pierre Mobility Group, is also, which also owns KTM Gas Gas and WP Suspension, has acquired a significant stake in the legendary Italian bike maker MV Augusta, uh, which is you know, which is all very nice, isn't it? I mean, look, you know, you take an MV Augusta and you're thinking, wow, there's you know, there's some really nice bikes. I mean, they are they are high performance, high quality bikes and they just look the business don't they but um yeah so the deal comes just weeks after news that ktm and mv entered into a distribution agreement in north america had remained a public yeah yeah it's always it's very interesting it's a bit like aviation companies Me, uh, you know many companies seem to be involved with each other at different levels and uh, you know this is no different here in motorcycle terms even more so even more so the move will see ktm and pierre and mobility step in to assist MV with its supply chain support and purchasing. What is also confirmed, MV will partly distribute its range via Pierre's worldwide distribution network. Exactly what these bikes will be distributed uh, is unclear, although it seems like a similar deal to one penned in the USA in September. Yeah, there we go. And there's a there's a statement from from uh, from Augusta. So look, yeah, look, KTM getting in getting in on the action with uh, other brands as well, MV Augusta. And I, it could be a good deal for MV Augusta. You know, it could be a good, good deal in terms of their, so, you know, their supplies, but also their distribution as well. I mean, it all comes down to cost-cutting exercises. And it comes down to, you know, trying to uh, make the bikes as affordable as they can, cutting costs wherever they can. And I, I would not be surprised because I would not be surprised if more and more companies start doing this. I would not be surprised, um, you know, if they start joining forces with others. But OK, right. The next uh, the next is all about uh, the company that you may love. Here we go. Okay, Harley Davidson uh, are in the news again. They've been in the news uh, for lots of different reasons this last few days, uh, and a lot of it is to do with uh, conflict, conflicting reports, I suppose, uh, or, or differing reports, I suppose. Some saying how well they're doing, some say how not well they're doing, some saying how many bikes they're selling, others saying they're not. Obviously, this FTC uh, ruling and... Um, implementation of the enforcement of that ruling is kind of making big news in various different press all around the world as well and motorcycle press and, and industry press and and uh investment press you know money and finance that kind of thing um and i suppose holly davidson does get a lot of traction in that regard uh, in sort of financial press because they are floated on the stock exchange and uh, new york stock exchange as are their subsidiary company livewire who took over the manufacturer of livewire one and also now the dalmar uh, they were recently floated on the stock exchange as well but here's the story the story is essentially that livewire since being floated on the stock exchange uh it's been a bit of a well. I, I don't want to say a flop, but it's been, it's been pretty. Uh, it's been pretty hard. So Harley Davidson say insisted on the spinning off of Livewire brand earlier this year. The U.S. bike maker was eager to establish a separate identity for its upcoming electric motorcycle electric motorcycles but it was also eager to secure funding for its new ev brand uh and this sorry this is all from uh Jelop, Jelopnik. uh there we go so we get rid of that uh so decent story here uh and 
So they so they floated it through a special purpose acquisition company, a SPAC, in lieu of initial public offering IPO. Okay, all this is gobbledygook to me, guys, in terms of finance. Uh, that plan was coming costlier than uh, Harley could have hoped for. Now that LiveWire's funds are being funneled out of the company by investors to a tune of $370 million. Uh, according to Ride Apart. Okay, so this is, they're coming from Ride Apart here. It's hardly been over a month since Livewire went public by merging with uh, AEA, AEA Bridges Impact Corp. Uh, they got a deal with uh, the Korean, uh, Korean uh, is it Korean motorcycle manufacturer as well? Or car manufacturer, I forgot what it is, for electrical stuff as well. Um, but initial investors who propped up the EV maker with a 400 million investment per right apart have withdrawn 370 million and left the company with just a tiny fraction of its startup funds. It's a big loss, which comes on the heels of Livewire falling short of projections by 251. It was it was expected to get an influx of 545 million, but got 294. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So you know how much, and it goes on and talks about different. Um, look, I, all I can say is go and read this article. Very interesting, very interesting article uh, there, uh, or, or a viewpoint. I would say very very interesting viewpoint. If you look up Ride Apart as well, I'm sure they've got lots of uh, uh, lots of information on this as well but look this is the thing that you know harley davidson and basically they floated they set up it in a separate company in live wire they floated it to generate a lot of interest a lot of company i think um it's very confusing how many sales they've made i know live wire the company are going to be setting up a uk a dealership or either one or a, or two or three dealerships i would imagine just one initially if you from here in the UK, if you go to Livewire uh, website, it only allows you to access UK a Livewire. It's a blank kind of a a single shot website right now. It's a, like a shop window rather than a, an actual proper working website. So they've kind of cut off a lot of things. There's weird weird shenanigans going on there as well. I've got a feeling they've got a big bloody nose in this, um, and you know they, they've lost they've lost basically 370 million of investors have gone in thought, right now let's get out of this uh, straight away uh and as maybe as the figures don't add up or maybe the electric bike market isn't as you know cracked up as as we believe I and mean, it's it's such a, a perilous time isn't it for lots of companies as well but especially kind of electric bikes who rely heavily on you know the the chips and i suppose all bikes do don't get me wrong and that's that's a bit of a cheap shot actually by me um because all bikes are heavily uh you know using parts that are hard to find in the supply chain issues right now but maybe that's had an effect maybe this is and look who's having to this is harley davidson baby i suppose so they're the ones who are gonna have to you know try and prop it up what does this mean for the company itself at Livewire? Well, you know, if they haven't got the investment to start an investment, that you know, everything's going to be a lot slower, isn't it? Or well, the plans that they had that's the whole point in floating on the stock exchange. It's a big revenue eraser, isn't it? So you raise lots of revenue, you try and sell shares, like minded people, but as soon as people buy shares, they want to get out of it as well. You know, that can happen as well because what happens is that. That you buy shares at a low price, and then all of a sudden there'll be a sudden surge of enthusiasm for a new company. People want to buy shares, so they whoop, buy loads of shares, price goes up, right? And then those initial investors, those people who bought loads and loads of shares, they think, right, price has gone up, take my money out, sell the shares. So they bought low, sell high. So they've won selling that take the money out, but the company just loses loads of money. And this is essentially what's happened now. Harley Davidson gonna have to uh, stump the bill. So not stump the bill, but they're gonna have to find a way of propping up LiveWire because there's no way that LiveWire itself uh can stand alone, uh you would imagine. Uh because they're, they're not really producing any bugs. I thought they were producing, you know, quite a few um, I thought they were already producing the Dalmar, the second electric bike, and I thought they were selling quite a few of the live wire bikes, but apparently not. Apparently, I, I was, you know, I I was given a, a figure of four hundred. Somebody else in the live stream the other day said, no, they've they actually sold four thousand. So I think there's a lot of conflicting information. There's a lot of 
smoke and mirrors when it comes to electric bikes i think especially uh not only in terms of the value of them but also the cost the cost of production the cost of the environment the the you know how green are electric bikes all that kind of stuff how much is it going to cost to run these things with all the energy prices but you know it's and how much desire is there in the market right marketplace right now for expensive bikes full stop right across the board whether it's electric or not so you know i I put it to you guys if you're looking for a new bike or a cheap runaround bike are you going to go and spend you know thirty thousand twenty five thousand whatever dollars pounds dollars shekels on a bike whether it's electric or whether it's petrol or are you going to spend something uh, under ten ten thousand you know five thousand Go into the used bike market, go into a cheap runaround, uh, you know, three or four thousand. Yeah. So I mean, that's the, that's the interesting one. That's the interesting one for me. Okay, uh, so Harley Davidson bailing out live wire. It's a bit of an interesting one. Okay, uh, let's get into this, shall we? Okay, let's talk about products. Uh, I'm going to go back up to uh, Visor Down here. Uh, they've uh, this. Uh, there's a nice little story here about this company, um, the uh, who making this Light Lock X Moto. Uh, this kind of bike lock here. Now, obviously, in, in the UK of the last uh, few years, there's been quite a few uh, things where where. Um, very naughty boys, let's put it that way. So I'm trying to be I'm trying to be nice and not swear, but dickhead arseholes basically. You're going around on little scooters, whatever, and nicking motorcycles, stealing motorcycles. And what they're doing, they're going armed with hammers and you know weapons to fend off people who try to stop them, but they're also going in with angle grinders and things like that to cut off chains, cut off uh, bike locks, whatever. Uh, and basically, this company, this uh, with this light lock X moto, uh, they've they've made this lock that's uh, really hard to cut with an angle grinder, and it's armored with a a, a baron baron lum. I don't even know what this is. Baron lum composite technology to fight back against uh, angle grinder attacks. So nice little story here from Visor Down. Um, so here we go. The trick part of the lock is that a baronium. Uh, so yeah, of sorry, of it's baronium. So, oh, it's baronium. Sorry, I, I thought it's a bit blurry on my screen here, or it could be my eyesight. I don't know. Uh, baronium. That's more like it. Uh, baronium armor coating. Uh, something that its maker claims it to be fifteen times more secure um, than the current best-selling D locks uh, developed with the help help of innovate uk the newly created patent pending uh, composite armor is bonded to an already hardened five grain steel core and covered in a soft protective outer layer interesting yeah very interesting so and the video they've got a video showing how hard it is to cut through it and all that sort of stuff but look i'm gonna go check it out very, very interesting uh and i think it's um Two products, it's 149 pounds 99 for the X1 and 249 uh, for the X3. Uh, the X1 boasts a claimed five times more angle grinder resistance than current best sellers, while the X3 is said to have uh, 15 times more protection. I mean, look, basically, if you're worried about your bike, you're going to go for the 249 pound, 250 pound one, aren't you? And, uh, you know, at least it would give those gits um, you know, a harder time. But there we go. That's uh, that's basically what it is. There's this new bike lock uh, in town. So I'm sure I'm sure other manufacturers, uh, you know, I'll be, um, you know, are coming up with similar products as well. But well, well done. Well done to these guys. So, you know, coming out with something that can actually work and stop people doing it. But the problem is, whilst it might take them longer to get through i mean the the the, the interesting thing i always say about this you know the, what's the we- where is the weakest link is the weakest link in the chain or is the weakest link in the lock you know and that's it and uh, obviously they think that the whole thing is really hard but is the weakness here is the weakness in in this you know in the small part the shackle part as it were or is it in the whole in the, in the tube itself 
you know, and you know these uh, these thieves, they know how to get into things quite quickly, or they figure it out, don't they? They probably go and buy one, and then they're trying to take it apart and see how easy it is to take it apart. You know, whether it'll be a hammer blow, but that's that's if it's taking them longer to get in, that's a good thing. But also, they're they're coming up armed as well with hammers and knives and who knows what else. You know, so if you try and stop them, you're probably going to get assaulted or or worse yourself. So you know, the only thing you can do is call the police. Well, guess what? I'm sorry to say this, but you know, the police don't tend to um, don't. Well, maybe they do, and I I just got a, a low opinion of it, but. There has been very much so in the UK the last sort of three or four years where uh, police are not responding to lots of different crimes, let's say, or lesser crimes. And, you know, a bike getting stolen by somebody, mm, maybe they won't, uh, you know. But if it's a gun, you know, maybe they will. So maybe that's what you have to do. You know, you have to say, look, oh, somebody wielding a gun is trying to steal bikes here. There we go. And then they'll respond to that. I don't know. I don't know what the what the answer is. Okay, so the uh, the other story here. Let me get rid of this. Uh, the other story here, and this is from Motorcycle News. Interest again. I actually like this story, and uh, it's all about this company uh, R E Z R O or Rezero or whatever, um, and they're basically making. Um, Body armor, motorcycle body armor, but it comes out of recycled. <coughs> apologies, uh, it comes out of recycled material, so it's all 100% recyclable and 100% biodegradable impact protection. I like this kind of stuff. I like this stuff where we're reusing stuff and companies are coming up with products. It's 100% recyclable and 100% biodegradable. That's brilliant. Um, currently, currently in testing for CE levels one and two, the purple arm is is known as REZRO, and is claimed to be capable of completely biodegrading in three to five years, should it find itself in landfill. Okay, yeah. So if it ever goes into landfill, it would it would just disintegrate into nothing within five years. Brilliant. That's exactly what we want. Our vision at the start was clear. We wanted to design body armor with sustainability at the forefront, but it didn't take too long to realize that recyclability alone was not enough. Oh, really good. This is a really nice story here from uh, Motorcycle News. Well done, guys. Uh, you've done well. They, uh, look, go, go and check it out. But, you know, the, obviously these are just samples. And then if it takes off, if it gets CE approved, then uh, then obviously this is going to run and run into lots of other products as well, I'm sure. I mean, the application, it's it's the – it's the um, this, I suppose, is purely just the the shop window, as it were, you know, of, of what products they can make with this compound, let's say, whatever it is. But obviously, you know, they're going to be <clears> – <throat> making lots and lots of other products as well i would have thought and well brilliant sam you know in the previous live stream i talked about that italian uh clothing manufacturer motorcycle manufacturer using uh recycled plastics to make uh, their um their clothing but here they've got a company making body armor from 100 percent recyclable and 100 percent biodegradable products great fantastic i do like that i do like that so there we go. That was uh, that was the news. That was the news. I could I harped on quite a bit there, didn't I? I didn't mean to. Uh, but anyway, listen. That is uh, the news. Yeah, let's get rid of all that now. And so the next bit is all about this. Right. So what's the what's the story, Biker Glory? What is going on in the world? What's going on with you? Let's uh, let's get into the uh, into the comments as well. But there's 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 uh, there's definitely a shift uh, in what is happening in the world. I keep on talking about this, and you know some companies uh, are responding. Um in a way, I think, which reflects what's going on in the world in terms of, you know, the, the problems and the energy crisis and also people's disposable incomes and everything. Suzuki, like yesterday, well, the, a couple of days ago when I talked about their financing deals, they're offering a direct finance deal with Suzuki uh, with a four-year fixed, uh, fixed-term deals. Um, I'm sure other motorcycle manufacturers are doing something like that as well. But I think some... Some are responding. Some are 
thinking, right, instead of pushing the big bikes, we're going to push the medium bikes or we're going to push the, the, the low CC. Honda, I've noticed, have been doing a lot of this uh, recently as well. But other, other motorcycle manufacturers are carrying on regardless without a care in the world as to what's going on in the world. Well, not, well, not that's wrong for me to say. Not that they haven't got a care in the world, but it just appears that they don't seem to be, it, the penny hasn't dropped with them. The penny hasn't dropped to say, look, hey, there's real problems in the world. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I am getting lots of press releases and I am looking at uh, press uh, news as well to try and make these shows, put these shows together for you guys. And I kind of get this feeling, this kind of flavor of what's going on there but you know there we go let's get let, let's uh I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, afterwards let's just get into some of these comments and uh welcome everybody to here uh saddlebag hello there how are you uh i said the same thing when i saw it put the rr's bullet fairing on it and a flashy carbon fiber bits just keep the handlebars uh clip ons are too much for yeah I, I i would say that with with the um with the uh the triumph i i, I don't know i it's it's missing something. Do you know what I mean? You know, as the Italians would say, you know, like that kind of. It's missing. It's missing something. I don't know. Uh, Daryl, uh, gut about Avon Tess. Well, I'm gutted definitely about the uh, the workers. Uh, definitely sure. I'm not sure. As I say, I have no news of if they're going to just shift production to somewhere else, another country, or I assume another country, and continue to make Avon Cobra Chromes. I'm not sure. I, I would not be surprised if there's some kind of gap, some kind of break in supply or something like that. Given how bleak the economy is with the energy crisis, it's all uh, pointing towards closure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, here we go. Uh, dear Bell, it's a great idea. Uh, dear, yeah, a motor GP engine and a cruise bike. If you've ever hung on to a cruiser 100 miles, down, nothing like hanging on to handlebars like a sail in a Cat 5 hurricane. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right um they're, they're not they're, they're not built for high speed and this is what makes me laugh about the you know big muscle bike or, or performance bike you, think, you know you okay if you're gonna do that you've got to definitely uh artificially as it were change your body position riding style but you know you want to get some tight leathers on you and a full face helmet and you know if you want to exploit it to its full potential i've no idea how fast this dfl is going to go um but I would imagine pretty a pretty darn fast, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, all we have to do is not buy one, then they will go away. I'm not sure. Or, or AVs, that is. Uh, well, <laughs> that, you know, yeah, you have a point, I suppose. Um, uh, yeah, maybe it's just a terrible idea in the first uh, place and not, uh, not green at all. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because... So many, I, I talked about this in a previous show uh, in some regards and saying, well, how green are they? You know, is it is this just uh, somebody been trying to pull the wool over our eyes for so long and people have jumped on the bandwagon uh, and they're trying to push it. They're trying to ram it down your throats, either through legislation or through, you know, uh, trying to convince you that, you know, 25, 30,000 pound electric bike that would do barely 100 miles an hour is going to take, uh, sorry, uh, barely do 100 miles range. And then, you know, you're going to have to charge it. And I think, OK, fine. If you want to go electric, I get it. I get I get the whole thing. I really do. But I'm not sure how green the thing is. Yeah, the green in production, they, they've got to be the same as electric, uh, as petrol bikes, if not possibly even more expensive. Energy prices, we talked about that. You know, charging these away from your home is is just as, as expensive nearly as uh, petrol. I'm not sure about diesel, but petrol. So where is the green advantage here? I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there is a, a green advantage to EV bikes. Certainly when you're paying over 10 when you're paying over ten thousand pounds, fifteen thousand, twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand pounds for an electric bike, and, and let's not get me started on you know the really high performance bikes that you know those bespoke ones like the Arc Vector, which is like I don't know whatever it is, a hundred thousand pounds, and the the Damon, those hyper uh, sports bikes, which are going to come out, God knows how much those are going to be. You know this Da Vinci, this Chinese one, I have no idea how much that's going to be. You would imagine it would be a lot cheaper, but still. They're going to try and earn their money on it, aren't they? So if you're going to go for an electric bike, 
Well, first of all, just know where where your um where your where you're going to be riding it. Okay, so if you're saying I'm not going to be riding these bikes long distance, they're all short distance. It's going to be my morning, you know, daily commute bike. It's a city bike, whatever. Okay, fine. If that's your city bike, then great. Then just get a cheap bike. Just get a cheap electric bike. That'll do it. You know, sub sub ten thousand, sub five thousand, or get a, an electric bicycle. Now, uh, let me let me share you a story here, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, it's not that one. It's uh, was it this one? No, not this one. Uh, not that one. Here we go. Hummer, right? This is from Fox News in the United States, right? Uh, let me just bring up the big um, big screen here. Hummer, uh, you may have already seen this uh, story. Uh, obviously, they got a brand new vehicle there. The, sorry, the 2022 GMC Hummer EV, right? Uh, da -da -da -da, electric bike. But that that's not the story for me. The story is that they've also got this EV bike, right? And is the the bike features an all wheel drive system in in wheel motors that can power it whether you are pedaling along or not, and it's got fat tires and all this kind of stuff. You got two battery options. Uh, you got a seventeen point five amp hour or twenty one amp hours available, a waterproof down tube. Um, there are five levels of pedal assist. Uh, uh, it could be operated by a th thumb throttle at speeds ranging from twenty to thirty miles an hour. Right. Um, Three drive modes uh, available, two horsepower and all-wheel drive, and a range of 40 to 50 miles between four-hour charges. Okay, so that's it, right? So let's. this is my argument, okay? If you really want to go down the electric mobility route, two-wheeled electric mobility route, why, and you're only going to be using it for urban riding or short distances, and you're only going to be doing 20, 30 miles an hour, right? And you're only going to be covering less than... 10 miles let's just say why why would you go f for a big electric bike why don't you go for something small there's actually a company in the u.s right now they're taking electric bicycles like this or electric bikes like this and what they're doing they're styling them into small motorcycles, right? They, you know, put like a, a fake tank on there. They're putting mud guards, or bigger mud guards on there, fatter wheels. You know, they're giving them paint jobs. They're putting them fixed pedals on there and all this sort of stuff. So you, you're basically getting a, a electric motorcycle for the price of electric bicycle. In other words, the, I mean, this, this, pri this one here, let's just say, I forgot what it was price was oh here we go you've got a price here for the different battery size right from the cheapest is three thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars to four thousand one hundred and seventy five dollars right so four thousand dollars okay if we had in this uk it'd be about the same price four thousand pounds five thousand pounds right if you if this is your thing is if if you're thinking oh okay electric bikes right this is what i want to get into then surely you'd go for something like this. Or you'd go for another electric motorcycle that is short of that. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of bump, I would say, uh, with the, all that, this whole thing. There's a lot of uncertainty, I know, in the whole market. There's a lot of, as I say, stories coming out. But you just look at the way companies are operating or, or you know, continue to operate, and you think – this isn't quite right. This there's there's they they don't seem to be in tune with what people really want, or what 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 really people need. And say, so, I mean, so I'd, I'd say I'm not anti electric bike at all. I'm very pro it. I'm just not very pro electric bike, um, as in terms of that it's a green option. And I'm just not very sorry. I'm I'm not a I'm not a proponent of that it's a, a green solution. I'm not very uh, confident that it's uh, more economical uh, and certainly at those prices. So I, I just don't think the value and the reasoning for expensive electric bikes is there. But I do think there is a place for electric bikes, definitely in the short distance category. And I think, uh, you know, Dave, yeah, Look, 
it, here we go. Dave B, here we go. Uh, 4K is a pretty expensive bicycle. Well, you need to look at electric bicycle prices because actually that's that's about the that's about the um, the standard price, uh, and and they they go a lot higher than that. Believe me, they go a lot higher than that. So look, the, you know, it's it, all I'm saying is this: if you want electric two wheeled electric mobility, I suppose that's the way best way I can describe it, right? You can get cheaper electric motorcycles or scooters for sure and you can get really well made electric bicycles that kind of give you the same performance uh as as uh, it's certainly for city riding than than the uh, you know than the other ones uh, than the uh look if you've got a city bike right you pay you pay you go and buy a live wire for thirty thousand pounds or whatever it was Twenty nine thousand pounds. It's the live wire from live wire one is a lot less, isn't it? It's about twenty three, twenty four thousand dollars in the US, right? But if you're buying that bike and you're only doing short distances, well, guess and you're only you know riding into your town or whatever. Guess what? You're only doing twenty thirty miles an hour anyway. If you're only riding on urban roads, so okay. Yes, you got a life wire. Yeah, you got a, a zero motorcycles DSRX. Yeah, it's all cool. You know, the, the cool factor is there and the you know the bragging rights is there, and you've got an expensive bike. I get all that. But in terms of function, in terms of practicality and function, you're paying thirty thousand pounds for a well, I suppose you could use the same argument for any expensive bike. You're paying really expensive. Uh, a lot of money for a mode of transport that a much cheaper mode of transport would do exactly the same for you. I think we buy we buy a more expensive bikes, let's say, more expensive cars, um, for other reasons. Really, uh, let's just say, for example, you want something that's more comfortable on a longer journey, right? Then you might spend more on a bike, let's say a Harley Davidson, for example, in my case, that is more comfortable on a longer journey. You might buy a touring motorcycle, right? If you want a bike that goes fast, you're going to spend a bike, you know, 15, 20,000 pounds on a bike that goes bloody fast, right? Uh, and you're not going to, you know, you're not going to settle for a 400 cc or a 500 cc because you want a really fast bike. So you're going to go for a one liter sports bike, or are you going to go for I don't know, whatever, but you're going to go for something that really is, uh, you know, the police ain't catching you on that one, uh, that kind of thing. Or you want to take it to the track and all that sort of stuff. So you're going to buy a specific bike, however, a specific bike for the task that you want it to perform, right? So if the task that you want it to perform is like a little commuter bike or a city riding bike, then you don't need to spend £30,000. You can just spend... 5,000, 3,000, 2,000, whatever pounds. And, you know, the more and more these, uh, the more and more these uh, products come out, the more companies get onto them, guess what? Prices are going to come down, aren't they? But, you know, but look, three, 4,000 pounds is, is the mark there, you know? And uh, so I, I just thought it was interesting when I saw Hummer, you know, Hummer uh, with that uh, and their EV bike. And look, lots of car manufacturers and motorcycle manufacturers have also bought out electric bikes the last couple of years, and they're going to continue to do so, I am sure. I am sure. Uh, another another good little uh, story here as well. Uh, I, again, this is this is an interesting one for me because I've not, I've not heard that there was a bit of a problem. But it kind of makes sense here. This comes from Visor Down, right? Um, Again, and I think it is the Montreal police, right? Montreal police have set up designated secure areas where individuals can buy and sell privately a motorcycle in safety. Um, the Montreal police seem to have hit upon a decent idea as they set up for specific secure areas for private individuals to use when buying and, and, and selling a motorcycle or car. I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. It's a good little story here from uh, Visor Downs. So I, I, I do suggest you go and re read it. Uh, but, you know, it's an interesting one. He's saying, well, actually, if you want to meet somebody somewhere 
and say, right, well, I'll meet you in this car park and you can, well, you don't know who you're meeting. You don't know who's come around to your house, let's say. You don't know all sorts. You know, so there is a risk factor. There is an element of risk. And we've all done it. And we, they even say it in the, in the article, yeah, we've all done it. Because we have. When you're selling or buying privately, that's it. That's, but they've offered this way where you can go to some kind of secure area. Maybe it's got CCTV. Maybe it's got extra lighting, that kind of thing, where, you know, or where other people are around. You say, look, you know, we'll do the deal here in public view, as it were. So I've never heard it. I think it must be one of the, the first in the world that's, you know, specifically come up with an area like this where you can um, buy and sell bikes, you know, in safety. So I thought it was quite interesting. There we go. A couple of other stories. Uh, there we go. So that's that one. That's that one. Right, let's get rid of that. There we go. Yeah, so look, I'm going to say, it's, uh, if you've got any other questions, uh, let us know. Uh, Stephen, hello, good evening. Some electric asset cycles in my HD dealer. Quite expensive, though. Serial one brand, part of the live wire thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what the serial one, what they're part of. You would think so. You would have thought so, yeah. But as I say, look, it, it, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to suggest that you should all go and buy electric bicycles instead of electric motorcycles. I'm not saying that. I'm just kind of saying that there's, you can buy electric two-wheeled mobility for a lot less than £10,000, dollars, shekels, whatever it is, you know. Uh, do you need yeah, here's an interesting one. Do you need a reg number insurance for electric bicycles? I do not know, but I think that I don't. It, it, okay, first of all, it depends which country you're in and what the, the laws will be, of course. In this country, I don't think there is, but I think there has been a big movement, a lot of pressure for cyclists in general to have insurance if they're going on the road and the amount of we've all seen cyclists on the road there's just like anything there are good and there are bad and there are some really really bad cyclists on the road you know not only just kids but adults as well and you know if you ride through the city i get it you know you want to beat the traffic and everything but if you're on the road then you've got to abide by the road rules so if you've got a cyclist that's just you know going through red lights and you know jumping you know on the curb off the curb and all this sort of stuff or you know trying to overtake cars you know and it just putting themselves in harm way where the whole thing is that you know cyclists want you know get really irate if you know cars or vans or trucks you know impinge on their safety bubble as it were so so there is there has been a, a big thing where cyclists uh, are causing damage or causing accidents or are involved in accidents i should say and they're saying well okay you need to have that insurance then if you're on the road you need to have insurance and i am a great believer that they should personally i think if you're going to ride a bicycle on the road uh you should have insurance simple as that you know it's how 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 are you going to enforce this? I don't know. Uh, you know, how would you do it? I don't know. I think that's the problem with it. It's trying to enforce it, trying to do it. And then registration numbers, I don't know. Now, here's the thing. When you talk about registration numbers, I do believe in the UK, these electric scooters, these electric scooters that kids have been riding on, or adults have been riding on as well, they go really, really fast, like 30, 40 miles an hour. If you de-restrict them, I think they go even faster than that. I believe they have to be whilst not many are right i believe they have to be insured and they have to have a little registration plate on there as well i'm pretty sure that's the case i could be wrong there i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure that is the case you know so you know there's lots of it's it's like anything isn't it it's you start off with something that's really small that hardly anybody's using and then it gets more and more popular. And then people try and find ways. Okay, well, there's there's problems with it. It's unruly, let's say. We've, there's issues with it. And then it becomes regulated. And then, yeah, the things that we hate uh, of regulation, sometimes you think, you know what, it's it's a bad thing, but it's also a good thing as well, you know. And, and it could be the way. I mean, you know, we make fun of this in the UK in that we have to uh, pay road tax, right? and insurance for for everything and obviously electric vehicles that have zero road tax and oh it's going to be cheap but guess what you know you ain't getting out of this world without you know you ain't getting out of this world alive are you 
So, and uh, you're always going to be paying taxes, death and taxes. Okay, that's that's a given in this world, right? So, if if the if the government are going to be losing tax revenues on fuel and tax in the future, this is when everything goes electric. Let's say tax revenues on fuel, tax revenues on road tax. Guess what? They're going to start start charging people road tax for electric vehicles. OK, so, you know, you, you think, oh, I'm not going to buy it and don't have to um, have road tax for my vehicle now because it's electric. Well, give it a few years and you will you give it a few years because they did they, they've done the same with uh, all sorts of but they've done the same with um you know diesel cars then they different size engine cars and uh, you know carbon emissions cars and it, it just cut, keeps on changing and you know you never really know where, where you're at with how much tax you need to pay uh, until they actually get the bill through the, through the door, through the letterbox, and they say, "All oh, right, yeah, you have to pay this much tax on your car," and you're going, "What?" You know, so crazy. But you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if you know electric bikes. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, people buy into the whole electric motorcycle thing. Then all of a sudden, within a couple of years, they're slapped with big bills because the government is saying, "Well, we need to we need to revenue raise off you you using the roads." basically and that's it and it could be through insurance or it could be through road taxes as well so i think you know i mean that, that's the story isn't it that's the story biker glory really if you're into your electric bikes and I, as i say i've bought into the, the the notion of them i've bought into the um the i'm excited to see what will happen i'm excited to see all these new types of bikes coming out i just think you know but you know, I'm this. I have the similar kind of view to really expensive motorcycles as well. Do I want to ride them? Of course I do. I want to ride every single one, you know. And I and I want to review them. Let's say, and I want to, you know, have fun on them and go off on adventures and every single one. I want to ride it, and I'll be, I'll have fun on them. But I'm I'm not going to buy any of them. That's the thing. I'm just not going to buy any of them. You know, the expensive ones. This I'm talking about. I'm never going to buy it. Because, you know, I can't, I could never justify that to myself and uh, to anything else. Now, if I had money to burn, sure, okay, yeah, that's a different story. But the, the majority of people don't have that. And, you know, when when things get tight, financially tight, you know, there's there's always decisions to be made, isn't there? There's always sacrifices to be made. And the, the usually the things that go are the things that go are the, are the, um, uh, are the big ticket items, the big purchases. You know, people tighten their belts, don't they? There we go. Uh, parking charges already applying in cities. Yeah. Interesting. Not so much about the parking, actually. Uh, when electric vehicles uh, in the UK here, there was lots of places. They were putting up the uh, the charging stations, the fast charging stations, or fast, just single chargers, right? They put them over, and you could just go in there and plug your vehicle in for free. That was it for free. Just plug your vehicle in for free. <clears throat> no problem. <clears throat> or, you know, um, there'd be like a business park or something and they'd have um, charges for free. So you just charge them. But now you won't find, you know, you have to pay for them now. Right. So, you know, so th that's one thing that's changed. That, um, that changed quite quickly, of course. But, yeah, you know, you charge your you have to park different places, uh, parking charges, charging charges, whatever. Um road tax whatever it's it's there's going to be you know people are going to be stung uh for the use of electric bikes electric vehicles in, in general and it's coming it's definitely coming there's is no it's no getting away from it there's no getting away from it but as i say the w what i find interesting about the the not just the motorcycle industry or the motorcycle companies that are, because as i say this time of year it's there's news there's lots of news because all the motorcycle a lot of the european motorcycle shows are coming out just after where motorcycle companies are launching their new motorcycles for the for the following year right so you've got uh, the german motorcycle uh, munich motorcycle show uh, was intermont which is last week <clears throat> You've got the uh, Milan Motorcycle Show, which is next week. You've got the Motorcycle Live Show in the UK, which is in a couple of weeks' time. 
uh, in February, you've got the uh, London Motorcycle Show. You know, so you've got quite a few big motorcycle shows and you've got all these motorcycle manufacturers saying, look, here are our new bikes. There we go. Because it's, you know, eye candy. They want to attract you and good for them. Good for them. That's what you want to do. You want to go to these places and you want to see what they've got to offer and what they want what they want and what and what they want to give you and what you might be interested in right that's the whole point so right now there's lots there's lots and lots of news coming out i guess i'm getting email after email during the day uh from manufacturers from product companies from um what's the word i'm looking for from marketing companies who are saying oh hey, there's this product there's this manufacturer da, 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 da. you know here's a press release on it so most of it i don't feature of course you know i'm just like yeah I'm, so what uh but you know the bike stuff whatever and some interesting products yeah i, I, th I think that's you know I'll, I'll try and show it um so there's lots of movement this summer autumn early to late autumn and then obviously in a run up to christmas November, so end of November into Christmas, it kind of dies off a little bit because people are talking about Christmas then. They're not talking about bikes per se. Um, that's it, it definitely time to wind down. Then it starts to peak up again in February, March time. It's certainly here in colder climates where you know you get a you get a proper winter, as it were. Well, when I say a proper winter, you get a wet winter here, wet and cold and icy uh, a lot of the times. Um but uh but, you know, and this is what always interests me about Harley Davidson, where they took that decision a couple of years ago to start off the year in in January with their new models. And the, the problem I have with that is this. Well, I don't have a problem with it. I, mean, I, I just think it's I just think they're at a disadvantage. I think they're at a disadvantage in many ways because they're out of this conversation. You know, this conversation that I want to have with you. Right. And I want to bring you news about about uh new motorcycles on the market you know honda suzuki you know uh, whatever ktm mv augusta whatever i want to bring you news of motorcycles right or, or new products or things that are going on what's going on in the biking world what events are going on all that kind of stuff so i in this show i want to bring you that but the thing is i'm not talking about harley davidson as in new bikes new models i might be talking about them in terms of what i talked about today about the live wire about financial stuff uh, about how the market thinks they're going to do but in terms of meat as it were in terms of meat on the bones there's nothing for us to talk about about harley davidson yes i know there's hot the whole raft of of uh videos you know about people supposing what um what bikes are going to come out next week or next year and which bikes are going to be cut and you know all the speculation all the room i know i you know it's great it's great to watch those it's great to talk about that but it's not concrete is it it's not concrete it's not concrete from harley davidson saying to you you and saying to me uh as, as a general public saying look these are our new bikes right so all this stuff the run up to it it's just other people coming up trying to find a way to keep harley davidson in in the mix as it were but they're not in the mix they're not in the mix they've taken themselves out of the mix and put themselves in into the cold dark january i know that they've done that for a reason and yeah look in some respects it works for them but i think especially this time of year it takes them out of the mix and, I, and i've said this time and time again it takes them out of the mix when you're talking about motorcycle shows the ones in italy the ones in germany the ones here um you know when we're having our uh, you can't really you can't really count america uh, united states and canada here because it's all predominantly harley davidson anyway so they don't need a motorcycle show for to publicize harley davidson let's say or indian because you know the market is so strong there however here the market isn't that strong for harley davidson especially indians right so you need shows to you know put it into the public consciousness or the motorcycle public consciousness and they're just not there well that whilst they're there don't get me wrong harley davidson are there then the uh motorcycle live show they're always missing from the london motorcycle show well they have been for the last few years from my memory anyway maybe i'm wrong if you know let me know but uh i, I could have made a mistake there they certainly weren't there for last year 
I didn't go to the previous year, but I don't think they were there for the all the previous years I went to that. I know. But anyway, but when but when uh, you go to the, the big shows and you walk around Harley Davidson, for example, and I've talked about this in the past, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say, or oh, I'm not backing out here. And I'll say it again. It feels as if you're OK. I, I have to quantify this right for somebody like me. Right for someone like me who's kind of tuned in to what motorcycle manufacturers are doing, and I'm really, you know, like we a lot of us are, we're really interested in bikes and the industry and what's going on behind the scene and all that kind of stuff. But for me, it feels as if I go to a Harley Davidson stand, and again, this is an observation, it's not a criticism, I'm not being negative, I assure you, or I, I, I'm, I'm trying not to be. It feels as if they're yesterday's news. It feels as if there's, well, what's the point of me being here? You know, there's nothing new here. So I go to a show to see something new. That's the whole point. I don't go to a show to see what, what I've already, I know that they sell. Yeah, you go to a show to see what they already sell, but they all say, look, this is the brand new stuff. This is the brand new service. This is the brand new, whatever it is, you know. So that I mean that's that's what I find, you know. There we go. Okay, we'll just get rid get rid of that block user. Sorry about that. There we go. Um yeah, Morris. Hello. Uh we've had wind up torches and radios. How about bikes? Well, there we go. Yeah, the wind up radios. I think the wind up radio uh was invented by a British guy, wasn't he? Uh, many years ago. About 34 years ago. I remember that. I remember on a, that on a um, being a showcase. There used to be a, those of you who are from this country and those of you who are a bit long in the tooth like me, you remember a an innovation program, uh, an invention program, innovation program. And uh, it went on for years and years and years. And uh, it was regular viewing for me. It's, well, it was a big show in this country. And um, anyway, and it was featured on there. It was featured on there, the wind-up radio, the wind-up torch, yeah. Um, but there we go. That's uh, that one. Uh, 975 Pan America rumor latest I see on channel. Yeah, I'm going to talk about this uh, a few few weeks ago as well. Uh, that, yeah, that's uh, coming out. I'm going to talk about you know, Harley Davidson coming out with new bikes, new ways to exploit exploits the wrong word um, use the revolution max engine yeah but uh, i don't know um no not how not how but that was a good one that was a good how was more of a kids program wasn't it really uh no uh fred dinage yeah do you know what he was only on the local news here up until about a year or so ago Fred Dynage still going strong. He was, I think, he's fully officially retired now. Uh, but he was still on the local news for uh, well for years. Uh, but no, uh, tomorrow's world. Tomorrow's world. I'm talking about. I think the mo I think the modern version of tomorrow's world is um, BBC News Click. Uh, yeah, I think that's the modern interpretation of it. But tomorrow's world was that was that program that uh, would always have um, that would always have. Uh, new inventions, new innovations, not only British ones, it would probably be global stuff as well, but the, the majority of it was British inventions. And they talk about space and they talk about, uh, you know, automotive, medical, whatever. It was a, a brilliant show. Uh, so as a kid, I, I used to we watch it. The family, everybody used to watch it. You know, the whole country used to watch it. Uh, but uh, But there we go. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, how was another one, definitely. Uh, but that was over with, because, but it's certainly uh, tomorrow's world. And uh, I forgot who, there was quite a few uh, involved in that. I forgot. There was some, they were big names at the time. I can't remember what they were. Uh, was the, sorry, was the wind up radio on the early, on an early Dragon's Den? Crikey, if it was. Maybe it's a different type because I remember the the wind up radio was definitely on a, a tomorrow's world because they were going to be shipping these out to Africa, and the, it, it was um, it was it, they were going to be shipping them out to Africa, and I think it was going to go into some schools and stuff like that into remote areas as well. Maybe it's a different version. Maybe it's a different thing. But yeah, 
I, d- I definitely remember that. I think, you know, I, I, I think there's got to be, uh, there's got to be an appetite out there for a motorcycle innovation program or uh, an automotive innovation program. And I think especially now, especially now with the the way electric bikes are, electronics, um, you know, new ways of doing things, new ways of manufacturing things. You know, I personally, I, you know, if I could, I would definitely produce a program like that. You know, even if it was on YouTube, I would definitely produce a program like that. I, Because I, I, I would find it really interesting. You know, it doesn't have to be high production value, but it's certainly something where, you know, a, a production company is going around the world and they're they're talking to different manufacturers and they're, you know, they you know, it, it depends whether the manufacturers will want to be involved in it and whether they would want to show their stuff. A lot of it is proprietary, so I doubt that they would. But you know what I mean? It'd be, it'd be interesting, I think. It'd be interesting to to have a magazine type program or YouTube uh, videos or, or whatever. But I think, you know, Discovery Channel that actually got into got into this kind of industry stuff or how things are developed and, and made. I, I, I you know, I, you know, there, there was a series of programs on uh, on Discovery Channel a few years ago now. I think they stopped making them. It was like, um, I forgot what the hell is it called. Uh, similar to how. It was called How Is It Made? How is it? How Is It Made? And there was another one. I forgot what it was called, but it's very similar to it. And then basically they show you how things are manufactured, you know, from sweets to knives to anything right so it's really cool they say well you do this they do that and do that and this machine it does that it's all very simple stuff as a narrator over it but it's all really good right i think a similar kind of thing could be like that an innovation or explanation program for the automotive industry or or, you know certainly for uh, bikes but you know for cars as well or a bit of both a bit of both yeah uh trevor trevor bayless trevor bayless uh tomorrow's world i can't remember the names i can't remember the name there was uh there was a lady i remember definitely was her name judith judith han judith something han something like that yeah oh it was not bob cowdorf what was his name boff wasn't somebody what was his name the older guy he was on nationwide something boff then he went to breakfast tv but then i think he got in trouble he's either he's either doing something with people with ladies or other people he shouldn't have been i don't know he's, he's, but um boff, what was his name? come on guys help me out if you're from england you remember the not graham boff it was some whatever he was on that he was on the program i'm sure maybe he wasn't i think he was nationwide but there was um there's a few other guys on there who went on to do other things as well frank boff there we go frank boff exactly right uh, thinking about it i'm not sure he was on tomorrow as well i think he was on something else yeah yeah frank boff well, thanks guys uh but there we go crikey that i mean that's going back a bit time like yeah but he, he got into trouble didn't he for for something or other uh being a bit naughty doing doing stuff but there we go anyway listen guys I, i've been going on for about an hour and come on an hour and 40 minutes there I think I could go on, go on and on and on and on, but uh, you know, I I think I need to go and put my feet up. But listen, it's been it's been a pleasure. Um, go and enjoy yourselves. Go and enjoy your weekend. The rest of your weekend. So I thought it's uh, it's a bit grey and gloomy out this afternoon. It's a bit rainy and wet. And I, I knew the forecast was going to be like this, so I thought, well, I'll get up this morning. I'll take the dog for a walk. Then I'll go off to Costco. Costco and uh, get a, a slab of uh, Danish pastries and I thought well uh, there we go and I thought I'd take it into some uh, work colleagues I uh, took the uh, Breaking Bad camper out for a little uh, drive uh, get a good old run so charged everything up so that's all good to go um, Costco would you believe they, they, I, it's funny I, went, I drove past it a week or so ago uh, and um there's massive queues to get in. I thought, what, why is there a massive queue to get into Costco of all places, right? This is on a Saturday as well. And I thought, oh, maybe it's football traffic because uh, the local football team were playing at home. I thought, no, there's not many people. A bit too early for that. When I went in there today, I realized what the, the traffic was. They've just opened up their own petrol station uh, and it's um, selling really cheap uh, petrol. So I, I wasn't in the market for getting anything, but there we go. Uh, <laughs> Dave. 
Dave Irby. It's even raining here in Greece. It rains everywhere. We've had a lot of rain here uh, the last few days, right? Okay, Th this, I was going to go, but I've, I've just, it just sparked my enthusiasm to carry on, right? <laughs> I got an email. I, I washed my bike the other day, right? And yeah, I washed it with uh, my uh, my gun thing, you know, pressure washer type thing, and um, laughed with it all up and lots of soap suds. Washed it all off. Thanks very much. And then went out in the rain. It got complete caked again. Isn't that always the way? Anyway, that is a tangent. The thing is, I was washing the bike and I thought, oh yeah, we've had so much rain recently. There's no way there's going to be a hose pipe ban now. That's why I did it because there's, there's no hose pipe ban. Surely not. Just, you know, loads of rain. Anyway, couple of days later guess what i get an email from um from uh the local water company now i don't know if somebody's dobbed me in or, so, or whatever they just sent out a generic email to everybody but they're still saying no we've still got a hose pipe ban i go what a hose pipe ban are you sure are you really sure about that hose pipe ban my ass but there we go uh so we've had loads and loads of rain and they're saying oh well our reservoirs still aren't full up yet and whatever and we still got you know the problem is that they can't fix the leaks in their pipe work. And this has gone on for years and years and years. So they're leaking so much that, you know, if they fix the leaks, but they can't fix the leaks because they can't afford to fix the leaks. This is what it is. It costs too much money. But there we go. So what we need it to happen is for it to rain all the time. But we don't want that, do we? <laughs> we want it to, to be dry at least. But there we go. Listen, uh, all I can say, we need a tomorrow's world for the motorcycle industry or the motorcycle interest. Um, maybe it's me. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll set up a, uh, a channel, a separate. I'll, I'll go to Discovery and I say, look, this is what we need to do. And I'm your host. I'm your host. So I'm going to go around the world and... Um, talk to people and talk to motorcycle companies i don't know whatever but i certainly think something like that would be a, a good a good way to go listen all i can say is thanks for all the support thanks for watching uh hope you're enjoying this new style of motorcycle um uh, magazine type show and so i'm going to try and you know keep on doing this on a regular basis and coming up with uh, discussion topics and stuff like that sometimes it will be news type stuff industry stuff and sometimes uh, it will be, um, sometimes it will be just general topics. Sometimes I'll say, look, I'm going to talk about whatever. You know, there you go. Uh, Morris, yeah, you got an email from Thames Water? Yeah, I got the same email then, yeah. Because uh, I'm with Thames Water as well. Uh, Ban is in place. I know, I, I was so surprised. I thought, what? Uh, nice work if you can get it. Well, yeah, I, mean, I would never get it. Would I? <laughs> that's just, that's just uh, you know, ridiculous. But I would say whoever, if they ever decide it. So Discovery, if you're watching, there's a market for it. Well, maybe just one. One person in the world would watch it. That would be me, you know, because I kind of watch that kind of stuff. I like watching that sort of stuff. I'm interested to see how things are made and, and where things come from and, you know, how how they decide, how they how they you know, I would love to know. I would love to sit in in the boardroom, let's say, or with the CAO of Honda, of Kawasaki, of Harley Davidson, right, of the bike that I own, right? I would love to sit in there and just have a chat with them and say, why do you make that decision? Why? Do, what is the reasoning behind doing that? Why, why did you stop that bike? Why did you, you know, and, and get their side of the story as opposed to us thinking we know or, you know, because the dealerships don't know. They don't know. But, you know, what you want to know is what their, the manufacturers are thinking, why they do something. And, you know, it could be like you could sort, okay, you know, five years ago you had this bike and you discontinued it. Why? Well, can you tell us, can you explain what the reason was, what your thought process was and all that sort of stuff? And, I, I think it would be a great, a great insight for us, the public, to see actually, okay, we may not agree with the decisions, but they're, they're making it for this reason. Now, it could be a very, very simple answer. As you said, we didn't sell any bikes. It was costing us too much or we were going to go in a different direction, whatever. And it probably would be. They'd probably shut the door on that line of question pretty quickly, you know, would they? You know, but, but I, you know, I think, I think it, it would be, um, it would be great to not only ask the fluffy questions, but also ask the, the harder questions, you know, to, 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 you know, put them under the microscope a little bit, you know, whether they'd want to do that or not, I don't know, but I doubt they would, you know, in all fairness, but look, the, you know, the likes of, um, 
the, the CEOs of companies, you know, uh, they do get interviewed by, you know, press, uh, television press, radio press, whatever, uh, especially when it's fun to do with finances, big finances. Yeah, they, they get interviewed. So I don't see why they, you know, why they wouldn't. But there we go. Right. Anyway, that's it. I've rambled on for long enough. The, the motorcycle world, there's lots going on at the moment. Lots of new bikes, lots of new products, all getting geared up for next year, I'm sure. Just watch your space and say there's loads more coming, and uh, we'll see. But the, so the news of today was loads of news from loads of new bikes. Uh, uh well, Triumph, uh, Hesketh, uh, Mac motorcycles. I'm just trying to read uh, the list here from memory uh, Ducati, BMW, their custom bikes, uh, Harley by uh, bailing out the live wire after they were floating on the Fox stock exchange. Uh, yeah, so but all the other stuff, all the other stuff going on. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Go and enjoy your evening. Go and enjoy your weekend. And I'll catch you when I catch you. There's a video coming out on Monday. Uh, I'm hopefully going to get out and about. I've got a few ideas for a video tomorrow. So hopefully, if I've got a bit of time, I'll catch one and get one ready for uh, Friday as well. Uh, but say, so definitely a video coming on Monday. And um, hopefully, I'll do another live show on, on uh, Wednesday as well. Wednesday as well. But all I can say is cheers. Ta-da!